Perhaps you're a housewife, or a successful businessman, or an up-and-coming star in your chosen career. What does it matter to you whether the Bible is what it claims to be? Well, Jesus Christ once asked a similar question that is very closely related. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? In other words, take some time out from the rat race you're running. Slow down a little bit and think about it. Is it worth throwing away all of eternity for 70 or 80 years of doing whatever you want? Let me illustrate the point by giving you a little perspective. Mark Cuban, the founder of Broadcast.com, is now an extremely wealthy man, self-made. He achieved what many wish they could, a billionaire with the freedom to do basically whatever he wants and to buy whatever he wants, like a multi-million dollar mansion in Dallas, Texas, and a 41 million dollar plane, a Gulfstream 5 he bought off the internet, the largest online purchase in history. He also bought the Dallas Mavericks basketball team for $280 million. This is what he had to say about his life in an interview with ABC News 2020. In some ways, do you feel he who dies with the most toys wins? He who dies with the life they wanted wins. That's all. To have I made myself and people around me happy along the way. So when it's all said and done, you know, if, if on my epitaph there's just a smiley face, I'm good to go. Now that's a pretty amazing story. From all appearances, Mark Cuban has the world on a string. But once again, Jesus Christ's 2,000-year-old question comes to mind. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? So let's take the success that Mark Cuban experienced one step further. Let's add to it all the wealth of the men whose names appear on the screen. Each of them are listed with their current net worth at the time this program was being produced. And they represent the ten wealthiest men in the world. Let's add to that the political power of the President of the United States, the British Prime Minister, the President of France, the German Chancellor, and the Chinese Premier. You may be thinking, if I had that kind of political clout and money, I'd be pretty happy. And you might be thinking, the only thing that could diminish that happiness would be not having the time to enjoy it. Well, let's say you've got a lot of time. How much? Well, let's say each grain of sand in this hourglass represents 1,000 years, and you could live in utter happiness for that entire time. Which would be better? To have the collective wealth and power of all of those people combined, along with every other happiness life could offer, during the entire time that each grain of 1,000 years passed away, and yet miserable forever after? Or to be miserable while each grain of 1,000 years passed away and happy one millionfold beyond what this life could offer forever after? Anyone with common sense wouldn't hesitate for a moment in answering, because it's obvious that even all of those grains of sand, each one representing 1,000 years, cover infinitely less time than all of eternity, which is time without end. So even if you could argue that a life of living whatever way you wanted is the most enjoyable way of life, and even if you could enjoy those pleasures for one million years, only a fool would choose the one million years over eternal happiness. Because wealth and pleasure don't bring happiness. And if you ask most of the wealthy people in the world, you might find they aren't happy. They may tell you their money and pleasures bring them happiness, but deep down inside, when they're alone, they may find that they're miserable and searching for the real meaning to life. Because material wealth doesn't bring happiness and deep lasting peace. Unlimited pleasures don't bring happiness either, because man was designed to need God. Searching for happiness in the physical world won't fill that need you were created with. Only God can fill that need. So despite Mark Cuban's probably well-intentioned statement, dying with a smiley face is not the objective of life. In fact, if you could follow Mark Cuban's life until its end, one thing would be certain. If he lives it apart from a biblical, God-centered life, it will be void of any real substantive joy, peace, love, and satisfaction. Because the reality is, a life that is lived according to what is written in the Bible actually brings the greatest possible happiness. And a life that consists of following your own desires and ideas, ultimately, without exception, breeds misery. Added to that, no one is guaranteed even one day, much less one million years. So who would cast away his eternal soul for this short and uncertain life, even if he could gain the whole world, which no one ever has? Does it matter what the Bible is and what the Bible says? I think even that brief illustration proves the point. If eternity is at stake, and it is, then the answer is an unqualified, infinite yes. Yes, it does matter. 
In fact, it more than matters. It's everything. If the Bible is what it claims to be, a book that God himself has authored, to reveal himself to the people he has created, then the quality of our life now, and for all eternity, depends on what is written in that book. What's more, heaven and hell weigh in the balance. Life eternal, either unlimited paradise or unlimited pain. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, I don't even believe in hell, or if hell exists, I don't think God would send me there. I suppose that would be a reasonable opinion, an opinion as good as mine or as good as anyone else's, if the Bible was not true. But the problem is, if a person stood in the middle of a freeway at night with his eyes closed, simply because he doesn't believe in trucks, his opinion doesn't change the facts or the consequences. No, if the Bible is what it claims to be, you and I and every person on the face of the earth have a responsibility to read it, to understand it, and to try to respond appropriately to it and obey it. Our eternal fate will be determined by whether we do that or not. That's why we've taken the time to create this program. The Bible also states that it's God's desire that none should perish. In other words, it's God's preference that no one reject his instructions and go to hell. But people do go to hell because they refuse to accept the truth. Which leaves our original question, what evidence is there that the Bible is what it claims to be? While there are countless ways that the Bible proves its authenticity, it's beyond the scope of this program to do that. Our goal is to simply cause you to realize that you have to check the facts for yourself and to help you to see that the cynics and critics of the Bible are wrong. That the very people who have attacked the Bible as a book of myths, not fact, are grossly in error. And it is also our desire to help you see that there is an awful lot at stake. At the end of the program, there will be a list of audio tapes, videotapes, and books produced and written by dozens of independent authorities that will appear on the screen. We don't sell these books, but we'd be happy to let you know where to get them. Then any honest person who has a sincere interest in knowing the truth will have access to more than enough rock-solid, incontrovertible evidence which confirms that the Bible is the only book in the world that can live up to its claim to have been inspired by God. But of course, in a one-hour program, that's beyond the scope of what we can do. Instead, I'd like to simply introduce you to a few archaeological facts out of literally thousands that unequivocally confirm the claims of the Bible. We'd like you to be able to effectively and confidently put your trust in the only book in the world inspired directly by God. It's a roadmap to the richest, fullest life possible in both this life and the next. The Bible can stand the test of the most rigorous academic assault and will prove to be intellectually satisfying to anyone honestly investigating the evidence. Don Stewart, teacher and author. In Luke 19.40, Jesus says, If the people would keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And that's literally what is happening all over the world. Stones that archaeologists are uncovering are crying out with historical proof of the Bible. For the past 150 years, hundreds of brilliant scholars have conducted detailed archaeological examinations at thousands of sites throughout the Middle East. Their results over and over again have proven that the Bible is reliable and accurate in every single area where its statements could be tested. There are some scholars who would say that certain archaeological discoveries do not agree with the Bible. But when we do an in-depth analysis of the archaeology for those places and for those so-called problems, we find that the problem is not with the Bible. It's rather with the archaeology. And so we need to do a more in-depth study of the archaeology. When that research is done, the archaeology always agrees with the Bible. Uh, archaeology can help us with historical events to demonstrate that, yes, these events uh, happened as described in the Bible. But that's as far as archaeology can go. The Bible, of course, is a religious book with a religious message.